It was around time for our annual guys hunting trip, and we'd already moved into Francis's cabin. It wasn't really a hunting trip per se. In fact, in the five years since we'd begun the annual ritual, we had never gone hunting. We would move into the cabin for a few weeks and watch the finals of the Champions League. The cabin belonged to Francis's father. It was more like a man cave than a cabin. It was where he and his friends went to when they needed to get away from their girlfriends and people in general when they were younger. But since he got married, the cabin had begun to see little use till we started using it. It was only a cabin due to the lack of a better name for a luxury wooden structure in the woods. It was a two-story palace. The exterior was styled to resemble a mansion, but without the cold, stony look. The cabin had Wi-Fi and cable television. The living room was large and stylishly furnished with imported rugs and couches, and the walls were adorned with the heads of game animals. It had a kitchen, a study, three separate bathrooms, and four bedrooms. It was like living in a five-star hotel. We went there to avoid the distractions that were bound to be at home if we watched the games with our girlfriends and fiancés. We would stay a couple more days after the games were over and then come home. We kept the location secret from our girls so as to prevent them from making any surprise visits. We knew they didn't believe us whenever we said we were going hunting. After all, it was difficult to hunt wild animals without hunting gear, which we never had. And we never had pictures of what we caught, only stories we made up on the way home. We got to the cabin towards the evening. We weren't in a hurry since none of the matches would begin till later in the night. We expected the cabin to be a bit dusty, like it usually was. And because Andrew was allergic, we usually had to carry out a little bit of light dusting. But there wasn't as much dust as you would expect from a house that had not been used for a little over a year. I guess that saves us from doing a little spring cleaning, Francis said happily as he carried his bags up the stairs and into his room. We both shrugged and did the same. Hey, Francis, Andrew called out from his own room. Yeah, Francis yelled back at us. Was someone here other than us? No, not, not that I know of. Why? There are some clothes in the closet here. Maybe you left them there the last time we came, Francis suggested. No, I don't think so, Andrew responded. They're not even mine. Are they large? Yeah, large and styleless. They could belong to my cousin, Francis chuckled. He knows about the cabin. He comes once in a blue moon to hunt, Francis explained. Oh, okay. He's probably the one who's done some dusting, I yelled down the hall since I'd been listening to their conversation. Yeah, that's what I just realized too, Francis said. We finished unpacking our bags and huddled together in the living room with cans of beer as we waited for the match to start. The match had barely started when the entire house plunged into darkness. Come on, we all yelled in unison. Francis, what was that? Andrew asked, annoyed. I don't know. Maybe we blew a fuse or something. The building isn't exactly well maintained, Francis replied, annoyed. Since you're so concerned, why don't you go check the flipper? It's in the basement. Fine. Where's my phone? Andrew turned on the torch on his phone and proceeded to the basement, grumbling and annoyed that he was currently missing parts of the game. Where's the damn thing? He shouted angrily from the basement. It's to the left, on the far side of the wall, Francis shouted back. Hope you're not scared of the boogeyman, <laughs> Francis said, laughing. Shut up, Andrew replied. A few minutes passed, and power had not yet been restored to the house. Andrew, what's going on down there? I asked him, wondering what was taking him so long. Just a minute. There's a little bit of dust down here. I have to be careful, he replied. Should we come help? Nah, I can manage. Francis and I continued to wait patiently. Guys, can you come and see this? Andrew called. We rushed down to the basement to see what was up. Look, Andrew said as he pointed with his phone's light. That couldn't be nice, right? The cabin had not blown a fuse. The wire had been slashed in two. The cut was too big and too clean to have been from mice. Someone slashed the cables, Francis said, alarmed. Who could have done it? I asked. The doors are locked, and we're the only ones in the house. You sure it wasn't just mice? I asked, knowing full well that it wasn't mice. Is someone in the house with us? Andrew asked, starting to feel a little bit frightened. 
What if he started to say, when the floor creaked heavily as someone leaped at him from out of the darkness? Francis swung his phone in time, and the light from his torch momentarily blinded the assailant, making the large hunting knife he had swung at his neck miss. Instead of slicing through Francis's neck, the blade made a diagonal slash across his face instead. Francis winced and staggered backward. Before the intruder could right himself, I barreled into him and caught his jaw with my shoulder, knocking him down. Andrew helped Francis up, and we ran out of the basement and locked the door. What the fuck was that? I asked them, my chest heaving. Did you see that guy? They had not really seen him. He was short and stocky, and had really long hair. His beard was massive, and his bare chest was huge and hairy. There was blood on his face, I said. What? They asked me. There was dried blood on his face. You guys didn't smell it? I asked. Smell what? You're not making any sense, Andrew said as he went into the kitchen to get the first aid kit. The basement had a weird smell, like raw meat. When I knocked him down, my torch caught a dead deer on the floor, I explained to them. I think he'd been eating it. What? Andrew asked as he came back with a wet cloth and gauze for Francis's face. The basement didn't have any other exit, so we were sure he wouldn't be able to escape. We need to call the police, Francis said with a grimace. Suddenly, an axe head came crashing through the basement door. We need to call them now, he yelled. We couldn't use our phones. There wasn't any cell reception all the way out here. That was why the cabin had landlines. But the lunatic in the basement had slashed those wires as well. We can't call the police without power. We need to leave, Andrew said in fear as he began searching for his car keys. He found it, and we all began running to the front door, but it wouldn't budge. Had the lunatic snuck past us and locked the door somehow? I ran to the kitchen to check the back door and saw that it had been locked too. We couldn't go through the windows either. Metal protectors had been installed on them because of the wild animals. We're trapped, I announced in alarm. Both doors are locked. Shit, Andrew said. The thick basement door was nearing splinters by now. What are we gonna do? I asked no one in particular. I think my dad kept a satellite phone in his study, Francis said. As we ran past the basement to the study, the door finally came crashing down just as Andrew was going through. The man swung his axe at Andrew. His short stature didn't offer him enough reach, and his swing did not cut as deep as he had intended, but it still managed to leave a huge gash in Andrew's chest. Blood seeped out and darkened his shirt. The swing made him lose his phone, and the corridor went dark. I shone my light down the hall to see the man standing over Andrew with his axe raised, and I realized that the man's eyes were well adjusted to the darkness. He didn't need light to see us. The light from my phone blinded him and offered Andrew the opportunity to crawl close enough for Francis to pull him into the study and lock the door. Andrew, are you okay? I asked him. He was bleeding profusely and his pupils had begun to dilate. What do you want? I shouted outside the door, knowing the man was still out there. He didn't say anything, but responded with an axe into the door. The study door wasn't nearly as thick as the basement door. It wouldn't take as much effort to break this one down. Francis was already going through the drawers in the study looking for the satellite phone. I found it, he announced after he found it. I hope it still works. Thankfully it did, and he turned it on. The door was nearly gone by now, and I looked around the room for something I could use to defend us. Andrew had lost too much blood and he could barely stand. I pulled him into the far corner of the room to hide. The only objects I could find were a paperweight and a blunt leather opener. There was an old hunting rifle on the wall, but I doubted it would be loaded, or if it worked. Francis was on the phone, when the door crashed open and the stocky man flew in. I threw the paperweight at his head, which he effortlessly dodged and lunged at me. He was heavy and knocked me down. Before I could get myself up, I felt a sharp pain in my neck as his teeth sank into it. I cried out in pain and stabbed him in the side with the letter open. He didn't grunt or grimace. Instead, his teeth loosened around my neck, 
and immediately sank into the hand that held the opener. I heard a loud crack, and he rolled off of me, and immediately sat back up. And blood and brains splattered everywhere. Francis stood over him with the hunting rifle. Smoke was still oozing from the barrel. He had called the police and had come to help me. It took a while, but the police and ambulance finally arrived. Andrew survived, and we never went back to the cabin again. The police identified the intruder. He had gone off the grid and began to live in the woods. He had eventually lost his mind and began to behave like an animal. He most likely marked the cabin as his territory and sought to defend it. Oh, how I always like going to the movies. Since I was a kid, especially during holidays. For Christmas, I would go see every movie that had to do with Santa, reindeer, or presents. Around Easter, I was the first one in line at the cinema to see in what kind of trouble the cartoon bunny would get into. And of course, when Halloween came around, I enjoyed a horror classic. What does this have to do with the story? Well, I'm about to tell you about what happened to me the last time I went to the movies during Halloween. Right around that time, about last year, a brand new Freddy Krueger movie came out. Yeah, I know it may sound corny that they would do a reboot of such a well-known character, but I didn't mind. That morning, as the movie arrived at my local cinema, I called up two of my best friends, Jordan and Tom. Hey guys, you know that movie I talked about? It's out. We're going tonight. I bought tickets. <laughs> Luckily, my friends were bigger nerds than I was, so of course they liked the idea. I got the tickets for the evening show so that it would feel scarier. At around 8 p.m., we were waiting in line. It seemed like the entire town wanted to see that movie. We got in, got lots of popcorn and sodas, and took our seats. As I looked around, everyone in there looked so excited to see the movie. I even saw about five people dressed as Freddy Krueger. Damn, I wish I would have thought of that, I said as the commercial started. Not long after that, the movie began, and I felt like a kid again. The same atmosphere took over me. And sure enough, the first victim died at the claws of Freddy Krueger. Everyone in the theater, especially Jordan and Tom, were really living the moment. And with every slash and every spill of blood, we would go, Oh! Well, almost everyone. There's something you don't know about me. I would always analyze the people around me. It was like a pet peeve of mine. I love to see the expressions on people's faces each time they would be scared or happy. So, normally, when the gruesome scenes happen, I would check out their reaction. But there was one dude who didn't seem phased by any of it. He was a couple of rows behind me, and there was no one next to him on either side. I found him intriguing, so I kept looking at him from time to time. After every scene that would normally bring out a reaction in everyone, he would have a poker face. It was like he didn't enjoy the movie. I kept thinking, why did he come here? Anyway, after the movie ended, we decided to go and get something to eat. There were kids running around everywhere, and they had the most amazing costumes. Much better than anything I would have during my childhood. Me, Jason, and Tom found a local coffee shop that still had some empty tables. We went in, I ordered a burger, but something caught my eye. I looked up, and a couple tables down, there he was, alone, drinking a cup of black coffee. It was the guy from the movies that didn't seem bothered by anything that went on. He was still wearing his Freddy Krueger costume. He had a hat, striped shirt, and even had a glove with blades on it, similar to Freddy. How did he get in both of their dreams at the same time? It's just wild, Jason said while I took a bite out of my burger. I know, right? Anyway, the movie was awesome. Too bad it only lasted two hours, Tom replied. Hey guys, I gotta go to the bathroom. I think I had a little bit too much soda at the movies, I told my friends before getting up from the table. I went into the bathroom, unzipped my pants, and, well, I did my business. After that, naturally, I went to wash my hands. At that exact moment, the guy who I saw at the cinema came in. I saw him in the mirror as he walked behind me. Hey, I saw you at the Freddy Krueger movie. Pretty cool, huh? I said. But he didn't reply. I saw that he wasn't going to use the bathroom. He stood behind me, 
before crouching down, putting his entire weight on one knee. Maybe he was tying his shoelace, I couldn't see. I dried off my hands with a paper towel and threw it in the trash. Yeah. Anyway, your costume's awesome. Looks so realistic. And <laughs> those blades look like they could cut something, I said while laughing. Seeing that he didn't respond, yet again, I walked towards the door. But right before I had my hand on the doorknob, I felt something wrap around my neck, pulling me back. I fell to the floor and I couldn't breathe. My airways were being obstructed and my vision started to get blurry. The guy earlier when he crouched down was taking off his shoelace, only to use it to choke me. I struggled and tried to escape. I even hit him in the face with the back of my head, but he still wouldn't let go. The shoelace was so tight around my neck that I couldn't make enough space between it and my skin so I could jam my fingers in there. Help! I tried to utter, but the fact that my entire body was deprived of oxygen made it harder and harder for me to move or try to do anything to get out of that situation. At that moment, I thought that was it. It was my time to go in a coffee shop bathroom on a dirty bathroom floor murdered by some psychopath with a shoelace. I accepted my fate. I, I don't know why, but I just gave in and closed my eyes. A ringing in my ears started, and it wasn't long until I would pass out and ultimately die. But something made me snap out of that state and open my eyes. Hey, let him go! I heard. It was Tom. He needed the bathroom and stumbled upon me, almost dying. He kicked the guy in the head, and that made him release the shoelace. I rolled around, gasping for air while Tom was fighting the dude. And when I told him that those blades look real, well, I was right. Because while on my knees trying to recover, I saw the whole thing. The guy slashed Tom's stomach, and immediately the floor got covered in blood. Tom fell to his knees, pressing on the wound with his hands. The guy tried to run out of the bathroom. Right when he opened the door and took a step out, I grabbed his back leg. Help! He's armed! He cut my friend! I yelled. Everyone looked at us, not knowing what to do. The guy kicked me in the head and I released his leg. He ran out the door of the coffee shop in a matter of a few seconds. Call an ambulance! I told them. Jason came into the bathroom and he tried to stop the bleeding. The medics arrived in a couple of minutes, but the wound was pretty bad. Tom was rushed to the hospital, and we spent the entire night there, drinking coffee and waiting for the doctor to tell us that it'll be all right. Hello? I said. Mr. Mayers, this is Officer Pollock from the police, he said. I was summoned to the station. They think they may have caught the guy. I told Jason, and then I left. Then, as I walked in, I was escorted into another room. Is this him? They asked me. I immediately recognized him. He didn't have his blades anymore. I assume he ditched them, but that was definitely him. The police officer then told me that the guy was wanted for no less than five murders. They were trying to find him for some time, and that I was lucky I got off of that incident alive. Yeah, but my friend isn't doing so well, I told them. Immediately after that, I got a call from Jason. He told me Tom was fine, but asleep and we should let him rest for the night. As I walked out of that room and stepped into the hallway, the murderer was also there, handcuffed, sitting on a chair. This is not over, movie boy. I'll cut your throat one day. Believe me, he said, before smiling, revealing a silver tooth. That image will remain with me for as long as I live. Even now that I think about it, I get goosebumps.